This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build your beautiful online presence and run your business. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and we are counting down now to the start of the testing schedule for Starship Serial Number 8, the first Starship prototype that plans to take that first significant test flight to 15 kilometers in altitude. Lots of interesting news here as well on the first super heavy booster prototype, along with the overall development at the launch and construction sites at Boca Chica. There's exciting announcements on Dragons as well. Yep, the next cargo Dragon is being prepared. The astronauts for Crew 1 missions are getting ready training for that mission to potentially fly this very month, and some beautiful new footage from SpaceX on the Demo 2 mission. Also talking about the upcoming GPS-3 mission and a bunch of aborted rocket launches. What a week. Starship serial number 8 was rolled out to the production facility at 9am on the 26th and slowly made its way to the launch pad arriving at 11am to begin its initial phase of testing, that being pressure tests with liquid nitrogen. The footage here of SN8 rolling down the road is a sight that shows the true scale of these vehicles. When compared to regular sized road vehicles you really do get an idea of just how massive these full size prototypes are. Slowly but surely the prototype rolled its way onto the site riding on top of the roll lift vehicles. This is the first time that we've seen that prototype roll down the road with the aft fins attached and because of this SpaceX decided to fold these flaps inwards for the trip to avoid any wind gusts creating any tip over issues. Once at its destination SN8 was ready to be lifted up onto the test stand here which already has that hydraulic ram structure in place. Those rams will push upwards during pressure testing to simulate comparable forces that SpaceX's three Raptor engines will throw at it while in flight. However, the wind wasn't cooperating, meaning that the lift couldn't initially take place. The crane was then detached and SpaceX waited for the next opportunity. On Wednesday, it was carefully hoisted up onto the launch mount. Of course, the scheduled road closures for the cryogenic test did move with that delay, and that is now planned for Sunday the 4th of October, so coming up very soon. Now, Mary captured a very detailed image here of SN8 passing by. What we can notice here is the lack of the COPVs on the exterior of the hull. These composite pressure vessels are super important for the flight of Starship. Therefore, they must be somewhere on the vehicle and not just simply missing. The COPVs are those small black tanks that we've seen on the exterior of every Starship prototype, and they provide compressed gas to the thrust vector control system, the cold gas thrusters, and the turbo pumps to spin up the Raptor. As SN8 will be flying to a substantially higher altitude than the previous prototypes, it's paramount to move them away from the outside, as it isn't very aerodynamic. COPVs are also very fragile, and thus they need shielding from these altitudes, as the maximum velocity reach will be much higher than that seen with SN5 and 6. Now, it seems that we might have an answer already as to where they were moved to. Mary captured this shot here looking within SN8 skirt and on the very far side we can see the bottom of what looks to be a single COPV. It would make sense to move them into the skirt as they are going to be protected from the immense forces of that flight. Also Elon Musk himself did say that there will be more stuff in the engine bay when replying to one of Corey's animations a month or so ago. Could he be referring here to the COPVs? We'll soon find out more about that. Now after SN8 was rolled to the pad, Elon had a tweet storm on Twitter revealing many new pieces of information. After tweeting this photo here of SN8 of its rear body flaps attached, he followed up by replying to everyday astronauts saying that yes, the flaps are now directly driven by electric motors with a gearbox, no more hydraulics. He furthermore tweeted that SN8's front flaps will be attached next week with SN9 coming up next month. Now SN8's first flight will be to 15 kilometers or 50,000 feet. This altitude is quite a lot lower than the originally believed 20 kilometers. However, this flight will still be one for the history books. According to Elon, this altitude is just high enough to test those body flaps as well as drawing propellant from header versus the main tanks. Now, SpaceX will complete several flights to confirm that all is working well. Then they'll add those heat shield tiles and proceed to much higher velocities. Those header tanks there that Elon mentioned are a vital piece of hardware for Starship. They are essentially 
essentially two small tanks that hold reserve fuel for landing. One sits at the very tip of the nose and the other is integrated with the common dome. This is so that when Starship is sideways or any other orientation, the header tanks are full and can feed fuel to the engine without gases getting in. Regarding the SN 7.1 test to destruction that we saw last week, Elon revealed some very useful information about that as well. He tweeted out the results of the pressure values that the test tank could hold before popping, saying that 8 bar differential in ullage and 9 bar at base due to propellant head. This is enough and improvements are in work. This number is possibly a little less than a lot of us expected, however the test was still a success and the Boca Chica team would have received a lot of useful data that can be utilised for SN8 and beyond. Now he further said that the tank was mostly 304L but also had some 301 in it as well. As it happens the vessel broke at the interface between that 301 and 304L steel. SN9 is apparently going to be completely constructed constructed from the 304L stainless, and SpaceX are even making some tweaks to that mixture itself. So yes, not only did the tank reach the safety margin for crewed flights to orbit being 8.5 bar, but there are still many improvements that can be made to these vehicles. Now over to the build site, there is a lot of news to unpack here as well. Firstly, SN9 has already begun final assembly inside the mid bay, with the forward dome being stacked on top of the common dome, and the section of the liquid oxygen tank seen in Brendan diagram here. There has also been some more news on super heavy serial number one this week with another section spotted by the eagle eyes of Mary. Now this time a stack of four rings has a label on it saying LOX stack four booster. Towards the end of the week Mary then also spotted two more sections for super heavy SN1. These being the fuel stack assembly booster and the LOX stack one. What we are thinking is that the liquid oxygen tank that's on the bottom will comprise of five stacks, each with four rings seen more clearly here in Brendan's diagram. On this diagram, the darker lines represent where each of these stacks are overlapped and then hand welded. The stack that was spotted by Mary is number four, which could mean that it's the fourth section of the liquid oxygen tank if we're counting from the bottom. Going by this, there should be four other stacks laying around that have labels saying locks stack one, two, three, and and five. We should find this out as soon as they start stacking this massive booster. Elon also tweeted some new information about the specs of Super Heavy SN1's rings. When asked by Tim Dodd about the differences of thickness between Starships and Super Heavy's rings, Elon replied saying that the ship rings are thicker than they need to be for now, so the same thickness works for the booster and the ship for hoop stress. The booster's lower tank will have longitudinal stiffers to prevent buckling. Now a beast of a crane was delivered to the site this week and immediately started to be assembled. Based on these images here we're thinking this is the Lieber LR1600 which has a maximum lift capability of 600 tons and a max hoist height of 187 meters. Over at the orbital launch site these huge columns have now been started to be filled with concrete. It shouldn't be long now until we see the structure on top attached and then we'll get some hints about what that flame diverter system may look like. We're all very keen to see that. That. We should be getting much more information in a few weeks time as well because Elon just yesterday tweeted saying that the Starship update is coming in about three weeks time. Also saying that the design has coalesced and that what is presented will actually be what flies to orbit as version 1.0 with almost no changes. That announcement alone is incredible so not long to go until that is fully unpacked. Big thanks to Mary and the team at NASA Spaceflight with boots on the ground, likewise Lab Padre with those 24-7 views and RGV aerial photography from above. Also a big thank you to all of you as well for liking, subscribing and commenting on these videos. We obliterated that goal of reaching 200,000 subscribers by October, all because of you. On the way to a quarter million subscribers now I guess. You are amazing. Now today we are talking dragons because there has been a lot of information and footage flying around this week to unpack. We'll dive into that more in a moment but first a huge thanks to Squarespace who is our sponsor for today's video. Squarespace of course is the all-in-one platform that allows you the ability to rapidly build an online presence and promote yourself or your business. Getting started is super simple with loads of templates to choose from as a jumping off point. Each template can then be customized to fit your style of storytelling and at that 
point, just get ready to publish. If you want something as simple as a blog, there are a number of integrated tools that provide quick and easy ability to share your stories, photos, videos, and updates. Once posted, you can learn valuable insights from that blog traffic and discover what works the best with the in-depth analytics. If you want to check it out for yourself, just head to squarespace.com slash Marcus House and save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. You'll find that link in the description below. So yes, months ago we were excited for Crew Dragon's Demo 2 mission because it was the first time astronauts had launched from the United States since the space shuttle retired in 2011. That was a huge deal and we had an absolute blast live streaming that with astronaut Scott Parazinski that amazing day. Just this week though, SpaceX released this beautiful video recap of that Crew Dragon's test flight with NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley on board the wonderful spaceship named Endeavour. This was it, the return of United United States launched human spaceflight and of course the very first time in history that a commercial company launched NASA's astronauts to the International Space Station. Now just take a second here to soak this in because these shots have been provided here in better clarity than we've seen to date. Those shots there of Bob and Doug rolling to the Falcon 9 there in the Tesla Model X's. You can just imagine how nerve wracking this day must have been not only for the astronauts but their immediate families. You have to be mentally and physically rock solid to achieve what these guys did. It doesn't matter how reliable and how futuristic all of this technology is, doesn't matter how you look at it, Bob and Doug were happy to take that risk of being strapped into this previously unmanned vessel and be blasted into orbit to meet up with the space station. Very, very brave and fearless individuals. Now this one piece really got to me too. Good night, Megan and Theo. And Karen and Jack. Just imagine for a moment yourself in that situation, further away from your loved ones than you can realistically get without heading out further into space. Then we hear this. Endeavour on behalf of the SpaceX and NASA teams, welcome back to planet Earth and thanks for flying SpaceX. As these incredible astronauts say in the video, it's an incredibly humbling experience to be part of what was accomplished here. We hope that it brings a little bit of brightness to a pretty tough 2020. And that there is a gross understatement. This wasn't something celebrated around the country. The entire world was cheering them on. A beautiful video there, so check out the source and full quality video from the link in the description. If you've still got dry eyes at the end of that one, you're doing better than me. But wait, there is still more exciting news on the Dragon. SpaceX tweeted this detailed photo of the next Dragon cargo vessel which will come after the launch of Crew-1. That of course will be Crew Dragon's first operational mission and will be flying four astronauts to the space station this time around. SpaceX is currently planning on launching this 21st cargo resupply mission to the International Space Station. This is exciting because it's the very first cargo mission by SpaceX that will be using this new upgraded version of the Dragon version 2 vehicle which is modified specifically for cargo delivery. That of course can be autonomously docked just like with the crew missions and that is going to be very cool because it doesn't need to be berthed anymore using the Canada arm. SpaceX went on to tell us that once this Dragon docks to the International Space Station, there will actually be two Dragon vehicles docked simultaneously. Between the crew and cargo missions, there should be at least one Dragon spacecraft attached to the ISS for the entirety of 2021. How cool is that? Now with all of that, we have this beautiful shot of the crew for that Crew-1 mission with Shannon Walker, Victor Glover, Michael Hopkins and Suichi Noguchi. They are undergoing rigorous training right now in preparation for that huge mission scheduled in no earlier then October 31st. This is going to be another very exciting month. All that being said, it has been quite the frustrating week of scrub launches. On Monday morning's launch attempt of SpaceX's 13th Starlink mission, it was aborted with SpaceX announcing that they were standing down from launch due to weather. Now because the launch schedule around Kennedy Space Center is so packed, SpaceX didn't immediately have a planned backup window for that launch. SpaceX had also announced the planned launch of GPS-3 on Wednesday, September 30th. The day after, that idea was cancelled with SpaceX saying that they were targeting Thursday, October 1st for the launch of Starlink and then GPS-3 on Friday, October 2nd. Now just look at that amazing photo there of both Falcon 9s waiting patiently for their turns to fly. Sadly, this seems to be due to that conflict on the range which we are quite certain relates to the scrub of United Launch Alliance's Delta IV Heavy. That again came within just seconds of lifting off but was automatically aborted at T-7 seconds. That came after Wednesday night's abort largely due to weather but this is yet another setback in a mission that has already been scrubbed 
several times, which has led to considerable delays over the last month. As mentioned, because this mission has range priority, it is frustrating that it's caused delays with many other missions. Saying that, just hours later, the Starlink mission had another scrub, so it seems like the week for it. SpaceX aborted that attempt at T-18 seconds due to unusual ground sensor readings. On top of that, of course, the GPS-3 Space Vehicle 4 mission to fly Friday was aborted at T-2 seconds, which looks to have frustrated Elon Musk with him quickly saying SpaceX will need a broad review of the launch site, propulsion structures, avionics, range and regulatory constraints over the weekend. There needs to be a lot of improvements to have a chance of completing 48 launches next year, which is the goal. Saying that, the GPS-3 mission that was upcoming is interesting in its own right. These latest versions of the GPS-3 satellites manufactured by Lockheed Martin are quite groundbreaking, and this satellite, which is the fourth of this type, was to be the latest edition of the current GPS constellation. This new generation of GPS satellites being launched is providing a significant upgrade to the systems that came before. These are the third generation of satellites for the US Space Force's Navstar Global Positioning System, and these beauties are said to be three times more accurate than the current generation for users of the system, and will provide better better accuracy anywhere in the world. It is also compatible with the International Global Navigation Satellite Systems as well, which will provide users the ability to receive signals from any country's satellites. That all helps to create a strong, stable connection with plenty of redundancy. Now that is just for non-military purposes. For military purposes, the signals are boasted to be up to eight times more powerful. On top of that, and I think one of the most important features for defense, is that these GPS-3 satellites will be harder to jam either by accident or or intentionally. Now this added line of defense means improved safety along with a huge bump in accuracy. Most of us these days use GPS in some form without even realizing it. In fact, it is considered quite an essential service, so anything that increases that reliability and accuracy is a great thing. Of course, the booster destined to launch this next beast into orbit was B1062, which is a brand new Falcon 9. Interestingly, to date, SpaceX have only ever used a new booster with these GPS-3 missions. The first launch for SpaceX, which was for GPS-3 Space Vehicle 1, was completely expended. They didn't even attempt to recover that Falcon 9 booster. The second mission for SpaceX for Space Vehicle 3 using this booster here was recovered on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions, and then it was reused for a Starlink launch last month on September 3rd. So for this mission with the GPS-3 satellite, it was destined for a medium Earth orbit of approximately 20,200 kilometers or 12,500 miles in altitude. The second stage of the Falcon 9 doesn't put it directly into that operational orbit. Instead, that second stage places it into a highly elliptical orbit with an apogee of that 20,200 kilometers from the Earth's surface, while the perigee remains close to Earth so that this stage can be easily deorbited. That, we believe, is around the 1,000 kilometer mark. So yes, Hopefully all these aborted attempts is just a run of bad luck, and we'll see these missions fly in just days. Now just a little update to the leak situation on the International Space Station that I'm sure many of you have heard about. As released by NASA late Monday night, the Expedition 63 crew was awakened by flight controllers to continue troubleshooting that small leak which appeared to be growing in size. Ground analysis of the modules tested and isolated the leak and pinpointed that location within the Svezda service module. Now work currently continues to more accurately determine the source of that leak. Keep in mind of course that this has been ongoing for a number of weeks and doesn't mean that the crew are in any real danger. The leak is so small that it is very difficult to find. Presumably they will be noticing a slight drop in air supply as time passes, so they can measure this drop over time as they close off certain areas of the station. I'm sure they'll track that down very soon. Now just quickly, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons here. There is no way that we could continue creating this content at this frequency and length without you. The support that you all provide here allows us to increase the time that we can spend, and that is all thanks to that growing list of names that we see right there. Thank you, each and every one of you. As that list continues to grow, we can do even more. This includes, of course, the work done by the production team helping me out. As support increases, that helps the whole team. So if you like what we're doing and would like to join our awesome patrons, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. That gives you access to interact with us more directly via the included roles on our Discord server. You can have earlier access to videos to watch before anyone else. And you can also have your names listed right here like all of these other incredible 
people. For those that can't help in that way and would like to just help in some other way, simply interacting with these videos as much as you can helps a huge amount. Liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, that is most awesome of you. It is you that loves these topics and shares these discussions with your family and friends. That all helps to drive this increasing love of space innovation that we are seeing now globally. Keep spreading the word because it all makes a difference. A massive thank you as well to my quality control squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be a part of this, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week talking about Relativity Space, Firefly Alpha, along with many Starship updates. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone as always for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.